Hello and welcome to the Life is Story podcast. I'm Josh Olds, and today I'm hanging out with two very special people, uh, New York Times bestselling author Ted Decker and Christie award-winning author Rochelle Decker. Guys, welcome to the program. Hi, Josh. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, we're glad to have you both here uh, at the same time. Uh, so just to begin, and um, one of you, both of you, fight it out however you want. Um, we're talking about your book, The Girl Behind the Red Rope. Uh, just give us your elevator pitch to it. What is this book about? Go for it, Michelle. Okay. So basically this novel came from an idea that uh, I had um, over coffee with my husband here in Nashville where the question got posed, what if our fears could devour us what if they were like monsters that followed us around and it kind of sparked this line of questioning that drove us ultimately to the girl behind the red rope Mm -hmm. and basically the idea is we find our characters our our lead grace a part of this community um this very strict religious community that's hidden themselves away in the hills of Tennessee as they um, basically prepare to inherit the earth. They Mm. um, live behind this red rope and they follow these very strict rules and they believe in doing so they have secured their spot um, in inheriting the goodness of God. And as a newcomer kind of enters into their community, their entire ideas of good and bad, of love and fear are really challenged in a pretty dramatic way um, throughout the course of the story. And we really get to ask ourselves, you know, what is fear and how does love exist within fear and does it exist at all? And we kind of wrestle with these really um, heavy questions, which I think personally we do in a pretty awesome way. Right, yeah. These these are just the the conversations that you have over coffee. That's just how how these things begin. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah the, where I am at this point in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, well, the, I, yeah. Go ahead. You know, just just, just let me just chime in here real quick. What um, you know, Rochelle approached me and said, you know, with, with the story, and one thing led to another. I got really really excited about it, so then we began to formed the story together, and then she went away, you know, and uh, we had the whole thing mapped out, and she went away and wrote, wrote, you know, we'll get into the process of how we wrote the novel a little later, but what really excited me about it is, is you know, it, it's like a massive parable. I mean, it's a very real story, and mm-hmm. contemporary story that we can actually envision today. You know, there's all kinds of stories like Handmaiden's Tale. There's all kinds of conventions that are somewhat similar to this, but this is very unique, and that, that what excite, really excited me about the whole story is that red rope, it really represents, I'm not going to spoil the novel here at all, we can talk about this more later, but it, it, for each one of us, we all have those red, red ropes in our lives. It's like the red rope represents that which we, all the beliefs we have will protect us from some perceived threat. Mm-hmm. Those could be religious beliefs, they could be um, all the beliefs in terms of what cultures told us we should be. But I think it covers a whole, a whole like you know, a massive variety of things. But ultimately, we see that we all kind of live in fear of crossing, of you know, crossing that red rope uh, and betraying that you know, that whatever we think will keep us safe from some perceived threat. And that is a massive issue, especially for Christians, because. As it turns out, so much, so many of our beliefs are really based in fear of some negative consequence. Hmm. And you know, if there was one kind of teaching that we would uh, that that we base this entire story on is that you know there is no there is no fear in love. John says because fear has to do with punishment or consequence. Hmm. It, and but there is no fear in love. So why is it that we as Christians, and this is the question that we ask ourselves, why is it that we as Christians live in so much fear? We, we call it wisdom, but it's actually fear. It's like, ah, uh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, because the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, be careful, be careful, and live in fear, fear of hell, fear of 
consequence of some kind, and that's simply not love. So can we, what's it like to discover love in the midst of this, in the midst of fear itself? Mm. Um, that's the kind of theme of the novel, but the, the plot is kind of a, a wild telling of that, that, um, that I think, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun to write. Mm, yeah. um, I don't know. What did you What did you 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 read the story. And you reviewed it, Josh. <laughs> what's What's your What will be your take on the story? What will be your one liner? Oh, let's see. Um, well, I mean, I wrote the review, so I could just pull up my review and read it. But if you want my, th- this is my thoughts now. I read the book a couple months ago, um, and I was I was really excited about this book because um, I, I I like. Uh, both of you, I think, are, are of course very similar in some aspects in your, in your writing, uh, but also very different. Uh, so I wanted to see how those two elements would combine together. I think thematically you write very strongly and very similarly, uh, but in terms of actual style, it maybe is a little different. Uh, so seeing seeing that brought together just in a technical sense, uh, I think it worked out really well. Um, but for me, what I kept coming back to is this idea of the things that you thought kept you safe are actually the things keeping you in bondage. That you yeah. have this, it, it is, um, you know, it, 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 are the boundaries that you set, are, are they boundaries that keep you safe or are they chains that hold you in? And learning to question, you know, question that. I think is something that a lot of Christians don't do in their lives. A lot of people don't do in their lives. Um, they they set up boundaries, but they do so in a way that restrains them, rather than something that is actually helpful and beneficial to their lives. Um, yeah, and, 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 and he, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, they just find well, they say, just find you, out you, that the things that the things that they 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 put together these these barriers in their life and they think that it's keeping them safe keeping them holy you know i can go back to the new testament and to you know the pharisees and all the laws they set up among laws to try to keep themselves holy and then jesus comes along and says you hypocrites uh everything that they had set up in their life to protect themselves to keep them safe was actually the thing that was condemning them and i think that comes across well in this book yeah, you know, it, it starts off with, and you said one thing, Josh, that was really important, in that most people are actually afraid to question their sacred beliefs. Mm-hmm. So just think of that for a moment. They're actually operating in fear. We operate in fear of our own, of, of going beyond or questioning beyond what we have been taught is the truth. So... It's actually fear that's keeping us from even contemplating what might be on the might be beyond the red rope. Mm. The red rope being being those sacred beliefs that we have. Mm. So we we actually we and we actually justify that fear, and we call it wisdom. But it's actually fear masquerading as wisdom. So we live in fear, and when someone does question, we absolutely we slaughter them. Why? Because they represent a threat to us. Because anyone who has a view of the world that's different from our own somehow causes us, you know, to, we, we dare not doubt our own beliefs. And so when someone else begins to talk about a belief that's different, no, different than our own, it, we actually perceive that as a threat. So we must kill that messenger. We must shut them up. We must condemn them. We must call them a heretic. We must burn them at stake. We must, and this is the lineage we come out of, you know, uh, for thousands of years in the church. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. You know, heretics were burned at the stake. This is not love. This is fear fighting. This is actually fear expressing itself. It's a diabolical. And that's our lineage. That's our heritage. So we get to start by saying, look, is it okay for me to actually wonder what's beyond the red rope? And immediately there's like, oh, 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 you know, the old guard goes immediately, well, that's a slippery slope. No, 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 don't, don't, don't. don't." Well, so then we stay in our own belief structure. Um, We live with the idea of a punitive God. The the entire structure that we've been taught, we're, we're afraid to even question it. We're operating in fear. But there is no fear in love which means we're not in love, so we're not actually following Christ in that at all, and yet we still justify it. Just that one thing, just, just the ability to be able to question beyond what you've been taught 
mm. is, you know, makes parents cringe. Mm. Mm. And yet, this is where our society is, and it's very, it's critical that we, we give ourselves the freedom to begin to, to let go of the fear we have of, of questioning what we believe. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, Rochelle, I'll throw it back to you uh, for a moment. You, you had the concept of this book. Um, the was was the red rope was it what this the idea of like it, it's in the title of course it is you know it, it's it's more than just imagery in the book it, it's it's not metaphorical it is a literal red rope um was there a point when that in your writing was that always a literal red rope or was it sort of a metaphor that became like we just need to portray this as reality uh, and it, it got itself into the book yeah, you're, you were cutting out a little bit and you asked that question. I'm pretty sure I understood it, though. Um, I, I believe initially there was no actual red rope. It was just there were boundaries. There were always boundaries mm-hmm. around the community. Um, and I think at some point, actually, Ted, you know, when we were kind of going through the structuring of the novel, he said it needs to have, like, a physical representation. It needs to have, like, there can't just be there either needs to be a wall around or there needs to you know the, just this idea of a boundary that's actually represented around the entire community to just really drive home i mean I, it's always better if there's a physical representation especially in fiction mm-hmm. you know yeah. as the reader's imagining it versus like oh there's a creek on the left side of this property we don't cross the creek and on the right side of the property there's a line of trees i mean i think originally um when we when I kind of started off with these ideas, it was just as like unspoken boundary. And we, and then later on decided to really give it form, but mm-hmm. it always was the same thing. Um, and I know red rope can kind of be a little bit, we went back and forth. Is it a little, is it a little cliche? Is it a little villagey, you know, c- kind of harkening back to that movie. Is it, but mm-hmm. it, but it just, at the end of the day, it felt like the right move to do. Everything's kind of recycled. Everything's a copy of something else. Everybody's feeling like an artist. There's nothing new right. under the sun. And it really made sense um, for this community, for what for what that meant, for it to be a rope, for it to be red. And the visual, of course, then is super cool to get to play with. So we went for it. And I'm really glad we did. Right. Yeah. I think it makes when – you, when you look at it, you're like, well, is it, is it a little on the nose? As a you know mm-hmm. symbol, sure. Is it exactly what this community would do? <laughs> yes. Um, so it yeah. fits, you know, it fits the characterization of their, you know, their thought process isn't just like, well, here are the natural boundaries, don't cross them, but it's here are the you know artificial boundaries that we've created, and you know, there's warning lights, and you know, the, it, it's very clear. Um, so I think mm-hmm. the you know it fits the tone of the community that Grace finds herself in. Um, and yeah. And highlights. And also it makes for a beautiful cover. If you haven't seen the cover yeah. of this book, uh, it makes for, for a beautiful uh, symbolism on the cover as well. So it, I think it really it really worked out uh, to for you to have that metaphor become a physical representation in the book. Yeah, originally, I will say this, uh, originally this idea started kind of with, with children, um, so our lead character was going to be a, was going to be a child, mm-hmm. maybe twelve or thirteen. Grace, she's obviously not now, um, and so there was this idea that um, you know the fear was the fear is the boundary. So the, they didn't need they didn't need a physical representation because the community was so entrenched in fear mm-hmm. that they would never dare cross the boundary. They wouldn't even get close to it, and um. And and that was kind of the feeling we wanted to keep, even adding a red rope. Mm-hmm. We wanted it to be like, yes, there's a red rope, but it's low to the ground. It's not an electric fence. We're not right. keeping people in against their will. They're staying because they believe in the fear so deeply that they would not dare cross. The idea of crossing in and of itself is a sin. Mm-hmm. Like even thinking mm-hmm. about yeah, crossing yeah. makes me feel guilty. Um, and so it was important to keep that feeling which is why we didn't make it a dramatic boundary it was simple like you could step over a red rope and then be on the other side but that you would never dare dare yeah. you would yeah, never do a, that it you know it, it's not really a physical it's a physical object but it's not a physical barrier it's just a no it, it's a physical reminder of 
something that's holding you back, you know, psychologically, yeah. spiritually, well, whatever. <clears throat> That's a, that's a really good that's a really good point. I'm glad Rochelle brought that up because actually, when you think about it, if you actually do take the time to think about the fears we have or the boundaries, the boundaries have been elevated in our lives as a very wise thing. And I'm not going to argue one way or the other. Let a you know, reader can take their own journey through this. But I will tell you this: that we don't recognize that we're actually worshiping fear. Mm-hmm. In other words, we take something like a boundary and we lift it very high. So that if it's crossed, we fall apart. We're terrified to cross that boundary. Why? Because we've elevated. We've invested great significance and value in that red rope, in that boundary. And it, so therefore, it, just the idea of crossing it, because we're enslaved to it, um, you know, only adds more fear. And this is the fear that holds us all captive and you like i said if you think about it we're worshiping fear rather than love 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 holds no record of wrong love cannot be provoked fear is all about judgment of wrong fear is all about holding record of wrong fear is all about being provoked so what provokes us well the fear of what might happen if we and so we don't even we don't go there we don't go there hmm. and so yeah the whole idea of boundaries we see that you know ultimately yeah, this novel has been described like by book lists as you know yeah a, an eerie novel that will long haunt readers and you know, they gave it a fantastic review but it's like it, it is eerie because actually we talk, we really do see ourselves in it mm-hmm. and we begin to yeah, see je- we're blind to how we have worshiped fear and we bow down to it and elevated it even within the church all the, you know, don't, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, all that, the entire thing. Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. The enti- you know, like that song, be careful little eyes, what you see, because the Father up above is looking down in love. We're characterizing fear, and we're making it love. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We're calling fear love. This is like, this is like this, in my opinion, this, is, I know this is strong, and people will maybe condemn me for it, but it's kind of like the opposite of Christ, which is called Antichrist. So it's like somehow we swallowed this entire, we've given ourselves completely over to fear without even knowing it. And I think reading this novel is eerie and haunting because we begin to see maybe for the many readers for the first time that, oh my goodness, I am actually in a, in a prison of fear and I never recognize it. And now that I see it, it's an invitation to salvation beyond you know, that framework called mm-hmm. fear that we had enslaved yeah. ourselves to. Yeah. So as you guys are writing this, I think to to write something so viscerally, you have to have in mind what does that boundary mean to you? I mean, it's, it's, it's a metaphor. It's whatever the reader is taking away from it uh, for their lives. But for each of you, was there something in particular where you said, you know, when, when you're envisioning that, that red rope, when you're envisioning that boundary, that you thought, this is this is what that means to me? Oh, man, there were so many. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's be real. I, I mean, you, you, if you're a fan of Ted Decker and you've heard him speak before, he'll be the first to say, and I echo it very strongly, as fiction writers, we write to discover our own blindness. Mm-hmm. So we are not, like, writing for an audience. I mean, we are, absolutely, and our readers are incredibly important to us, but the first audience, the first reader is us. Mm-hmm. Like, we are creating, we're asking questions that we're afraid of the answer that our character might find because it illuminates our own blindness, our own sickness, our own darkness, whatever, you know, term you want to you wanna call that. Some would say our own sin. Um, these are all just words. So, you know, our own blindness, that's that's what I really love. So going in to this novel, um, you know, I originally planned to write this novel on my own with a different publisher who was too afraid of it. And that in of itself was terrifying. <laughs> I mean, it was it was just so much fear illuminated over and over and over. And I mean, for six months, I went round and round trying to make it appropriate, trying to make it fit 
in a box that didn't terrify, you know, somebody who had paid me to write it. And we could not reconcile. And that in and of itself was like, an, was like a warning, not really a warning bell. It was like a tiny whisper in the middle of the night that reminded me, this is why you need to write it. This is the exact reason why the story needs to be told, because even the idea of the story is threatening, because it illuminates something very visual. So I think to say, what was the red rope for me? It was all of my life. Mm-hmm. It was all, it was my, my, you know, the fear of my, uh, losing my career. I mean, that was the one that was was being most amplified at the time. Like I had worked, you know, significant for a significant amount of years. I had written, you know, I'm going on. This is obviously my fifth novel, fifth uh, novel published, but you know, my tenth novel written. Mm-hmm. So, um, and what if all of that was for nothing? What if I've gone too far? What if I can't rein it back in? What if I have to sell out? in a sense, right? What if I have to write novels that are easy to swallow, otherwise they won't pay me? What I had to, what if, I was literally having conversations with my husband about going back to work, like in an mm-hmm. office. Like, mm-hmm. what would I do? What if I can't sell this? What if nobody wants it because it's too dramatic? Do I pull back and write something that's <clears throat> fun to read and easy to swallow, or do I press on and examine this fear and why am I so afraid of losing what I've worked for and, and the security that that brings me and the, and, and the, the way that it attacks my ego because I'm a writer and I, I, I won a Christie award and what do you mean? I can't write what I, you know, all of those things. So, I mean, at that time that was the most illuminating, but then, you know, this novel came out a couple of months ago and it's been, I mean, a couple of weeks ago and it's been in the process of that. And my latest fear is being a mom for the new time for the first mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And, you know, that will rock your entire world, <laughs> becoming a parent. I mean, there's nothing quite as terrifying as that, it, it seems. So I would say, you know, all of my life, this illuminated all, even down to little things. Like, you know, when I am afraid that I, I step out, you know, of my house and people are judging me because of the way that I look. You know, I'm a mom for the first time, and I haven't showered in two days, and I have no makeup on, but I have to go to the store and get milk because otherwise, you know, none of us will get to eat. So, and I mean, all of those little, it's incredible once you start thinking about it, how often your mind is, what if, what if, what if, be careful, be careful, be careful, protect, protect, protect. Mm. In the simplest moments and in the grand moments, it's disturbing. Jesus actually says, you know, that it's disturbing. Initially, when you begin to see, you will be disturbed, and then you will find great joy. That's not exactly it, but it's along those lines. Ted probably knows exactly what it is. <laughs> and it's, that's what, it's very, writing this novel it became disturbing. We were like, oh, my gosh, is there anything in my life where I'm not afraid? Mm-hmm. Is there anything I'm not afraid of? That's a very yeah, I, heavy question. I, I think, you know, if I could jump in here on this, on this, on this topic, you know, in terms of my my fears, they mirror ourselves, because I think they mirror all of us. There's a very profound need for belonging, the, 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 the egoic construct or the carnal nature or the small self or the earthen vessel. I mean, use whatever label you want. Or the personality self, the suffering self, needs its own gods in this world, its own mirrors to reflect back to itself, its value, and society has become that. You know, our friends have become that. Our, all our relationships have become that. Once we look at it, we're afraid of losing honor or losing belonging. And for me, as an, uh, on, on the end, other end of the spectrum from, <clears throat> you know, Rochelle in some respects, I mean, I, this is my 41st novel, I think it is, or something. I don't know. It's a lot of novels, but it's mm-hmm. like over the course of my career, as I, the more success I had, you know, getting paid a lot more money, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the, the entire thing. I mean, I basically, you know, it's kind of a cliche. I, I kind of rose to the top and took this journey, the, all the while feeling like I was a humble person, you know, like doing my very best and writing about my own fears throughout all of it. But in that process, I mean, I, I, I realized just a few years ago, actually, that, oh, my goodness, I am terrified of losing my audience. Like, if they knew my own struggles, and they, if they, if they can see what I'm seeing now in terms of how deeply married we are to fear, all of us, 
you know, it, when we first begin to see it, it is it is somewhat disturbing. It is kind of like having your eyes opening and seeing, like in the novel, these wraiths. I mean, these the fury, the the darkness in visceral form all around us, and we're the creators of that, right? What if our fears actually were manifested and showed themselves as beings? We'd be suddenly we'd be we'd be like, no, no, no. It's like all the monsters around us. We want to put them back under the rug or shove them back into the basement, and close the door, but then they continue to live in us. We have to actually, you know, we have <laughs> we can actually deal with them by being the light, and in the light they vanish. But me, for me, I actually had, had this really significant fear of losing, just like Rochelle, everything. I think, you know, my fear has been being rejected by my fans. Mm. In other words, if I cross that red rope and ask the questions that I'm asking myself, and I did that publicly in a novel, who would leave and say, oh, he's this, oh, he's this, you know, because I'm no longer, I'm asking questions about the orthodox beliefs that we have been imprinted with. When I say it's not like I'm not orthodox, I consider myself to be, to be ultimately true orthodox, which is actually, you know, I follow the orthodox teachings of Jesus, mm-hmm. not as interpreted by the Catholic Church, you, you know, 1,700 years ago or 200 years after the death of Jesus, when it was turned into something new. So, I, I'm, I mean, I don't want to get into theology here, but... The, but bottom line is that in our culture, if you question, you are crucified. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. are just 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 for questioning, and it is. It, it, and it's kind of like it's kind of. I I I see it as the power and the principality of the world, which some you know. In other words, it is what Paul characterizes as that great power of fear. That it's like this massive monster, and Christianity is married to it. As much as any other religion, and, and and any individual knows, we know that we have made an agreement with that fear when we when we feel it, and we 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 are in a place where I'm terrified of losing my status, my acceptance. It's always the fear of loss is always the greatest the greatest fear, right? Yeah. What if I lose my income? What if I what if I'm branded a heretic? What if I'm thrown aside? And now I have, you know, my whole life I've struggled for some form of acceptance. And now what if everybody just abandons me because I ask these questions and I'm just being authentic about my own struggles and I'm saying, hey guys, I'm seeing this, what are you seeing? Even to ask that question in our culture, our culture of purity, and so we've kind of like sanitized our country. We even want to build walls so nobody else can come in. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but we want to protect what is our treasured little sacred space. And we're doing it in fear. But we're all that way in our hearts. And so the invitation for all of us is actually to, one, the first step is to see it, to see that, oh, my goodness, I, my, my life is being run by fear, just like Rochelle said. Without seeing that, you, you'll never go on a journey to unmask it and to, you know, bring it into the light. Never. And so we continue in the lives, are continuing our lives unchanged. We're continuing our lives looking just like everyone else living in fear, and we're just calling it something else. So, yeah, losing audience, losing the people that are hearing me right now as, you know, audience. I mean, when I was my readers, that was that's been a huge fear of mine. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this this book more than probably any other book, you know, that I've written, um, you know, and the Rochelle, this is true for Rochelle as, as well. It, it kind of pulls the blinders off, and it's like it, it's kind of a statement of courage, saying, "Hey guys, what is this? What if this is what's happening?" And the reader can make up their own mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. I that, mean, there were. Go ahead. There were a couple of times where you know we're having conversations after the first draft was written, and Ted's going through and kind of you know adding uh, his voice and you know making it a, a killer novel. Um, we're, we were on the phone talking through this scene, through that scene, through, and he'd say, what if we do this? And I'd be like, no, we can't. We can't say <laughs> that. Much. And he'd be like, well, we can. I'd be like, I mean, okay, so I'm going to lose my career. I mean, you know, obviously I'm, I'm being overdramatic, but we definitely had conversations where, like, do we go that far? Like, mm-hmm. do we really push it? Do we use that language? Do we call it what it is? Because that <laughs> is fearful. 
And then we well, did. I remember, Rochelle, I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I remember, like, I, remember I, was, I locked myself in a hotel down in Chattanooga because Rochelle had written the first draft. You know, we plotted it together, then she wrote the first draft. And I, sat, and I, and I was down there for like, um, uh, and like several trips for, for a total of like almost a month or like 25 days or something like this. And, you know, I'm going through line by line and I'm kind of, well, I'm doing my bit, right? I'm rewriting the story and editing and this, that, and just doing that whole process. And, and I remember, like, it, it was really strange. There were so many points where I'd come to a line and I'd just write the line authentically from me, meaning, like, the kinds of things Rochelle's talking about. Like, whoa, I never would have said this in a previous novel. And I was, but I just, and it was in, in those two voices in my head, one voice was saying, wow, they're going to kill you for that. And that's the voice of the accuser. And then, but there was another part of me, which is like, this light, there's, there's no fear in it. And I just said, no. I said, no, thank you. I didn't condemn the fear. I just offered it love. And I would have just said, okay, it's okay. I know you're afraid. It's okay. And I just write it and write that line and in, in a way that I never have in previous novels. And it was like, I, and I remember say, thinking to myself, why are you doing this? Like, it was almost like a compulsion. I couldn't, I couldn't. It was like something... Something in me just was like, and no, it's time. It's time. Just write it. Just say it. It's okay. Just say it. It was like this holy confidence. I don't know what you want to call it. But as I was writing, I said, yep, yep, some people aren't going to like this. But I have to be authentic now. I can no longer hide behind my own red ropes. Mm-hmm. You know, I get to just be and say and question and put it out there. Because to me, it's so obvious, and so why am I hiding? Why am I hiding? And then I come back and show Rochelle, and she's like, ah! You know, like, <laughs> but, but, but and she knew what was happening, too, and she said, yep, yep, okay, well, mm-hmm. what will happen will happen. And so and the result is this novel. Mm-hmm. So I, I think this begs the question, and, and I, I know the answer to this, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but was there any point in the writing or in the rewriting where you went, no, that's too much. We have to tone that down. Um, or was it really just, all right, this is what we're saying? Yeah, I mean, it became, it, the, the, it started, no, we need to tone that down. Mm-hmm. And then after a couple minutes of discussion, you know, agreeing, actually, you know what, no. What would be the point? What mm-hmm. would be the point if we toned it down? We might as well not put the novel out. Right. Because that's not the point. <laughs> we, we're missing it if we if we surrender to the fear or c- continue to make an agreement with the fear and we continue to let it guide us, then we might as well stop writing this novel and and go yeah, back. Write it or for me, mm-hmm. like go back to writing novels that are safe. Um, and we decided, no, we're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> yeah, and you know, we talked here to Andrea and Vic, you know, at. At oh yeah. Don't, don't, because we turned it in. It, 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 again, what Rochelle just said is so, so critical. Our own red rope. One of our red ropes was the fear of speaking out. You know, I mean, the fear of just being hurt, and um, which, by the way, is pervasive in our society. It's just absolutely pervasive, especially in the church, but in Christianity. In the, and when I say the church, I mean the religious the religious institution called Christianity. Um, so anyway, uh, she she read it. When we turned it in, she read it. And her response to it, to all those things, was, nope, this is right. Mm-hmm. And she, In fact, she was deeply moved by that, not just that courage, but she didn't find any issues with any of that. The previous publisher that Rochelle was with, if she would have tried to write a novel, anything similar to this, you know, to, to the, previous, or the previous publisher that she'd, she was with would have absolutely rejected it. So it was. It, I, I just have major props to Baker mm-hmm. and to um, Ravel. They are an incredible publisher. I mean, if there's anybody out there that wants to write a novel that is authentic and not just parroting, you know, the choir, so to speak. Ravel is, uh, in my experience, you know, one of the, one of the best publishers out there. So. That really gave us, a, that was a real nod to us. That was a real, mm. yeah, yeah, you know, there was never any question after, after that. Yeah, that's that's good. That's good. Um, I know we are quickly, quickly 
uh, running out of time, so I want to get through a few questions um, before we get into our spoiler segment, because I have a, definitely a few burning questions that is going to dip into spoilers. Uh, but just about, I guess, the future for the two of you, because you guys, you guys have written this novel together now. Is that going to be a continued thing? Do you see yourself continuing to co-author novels in the future? I mean, well, we I think neither one of us know. really... Yeah, we don't really know what it holds. Mm -hmm. If the right story came about at the right time, I think both of us would definitely be open to it. But mm -hmm. as of right now, there aren't, like, actual plans in the work. He's getting ready to jump in, he hasn't said, into, his, uh, into another novel here before the end of the year. I'm getting ready to wrap up um, in the next couple of weeks the novel I've been working on over the last four or five months. And so... Um, we definitely have solo projects, but I think, oh, I shouldn't speak for Ted, but I say we'd be open to it if the right yeah. story came along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that, I mean, I mean, I think time will tell the book's only been out for a week or so. Um, I think probably two weeks by the time this, this interview airs. Uh, but I, I, I say that I enjoyed it and I, I found myself like, okay, well, if they keep writing together, then I get twice the Decker, but only one book. But they write separately. <laughs> then I get two books. I'm confused. Which one do I go for? Um, and I think that the I think the correct answer is probably probably a mix of, of both. Um, but I I really you know I, I I like the concept. I'm glad the, t the two of you work together. Um, I think like, again as you described the process, um, the writing process. I think it's a it, it it can be such an isolating experience to write a novel because. It's just you alone in front of your computer, and to have the ability to, as you're writing it, have those conversations with someone else who knows that world as intimately as you, I think really does make the book better because it stretches you and challenges you and forces you to, to take a look at your blind spots, and the two of you play off each other really well in that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah, you very thank much. You. It was yeah. great. I mean, a okay. collaborative effort like that mm -hmm. really really works if there's real alignment, you know. Right. Um, and Rochelle and I are very much aligned in terms of our, our view of the world. And so that that's huge. All right. So we're going to get to our spoilers now. So if you have not read the book, this is your warning uh, that anything past this uh, has the potential to be a spoiler. Um, go read the book. If you haven't read the book, that's not my fault. That's your fault. You know, they wrote it. They published it. Revel published it. It's out there on bookshelves. You can buy it on Amazon. You you have your chance. Um, so if you haven't read it, press pause. Click over to Amazon.com. Go out to your local bookstore. Get the book. Read the book. And then come back to this last about 10 minutes or so. Okay, you've had time to pause. Uh, it, it's on you now. So, into spoilers. There was a scene for me, I think it's it, it's probably maybe two-thirds or three-fourths the way in the book, and Grace is outside of the commune, and for the first time, she she's beyond the red rope, and for the first time, she looks back and she sees the fury just surrounding the village. And... She just sees that darkness that's consuming where she's lived at all these years. And it, it's not necessarily a shock revelation that the Fury were there the whole time. Um, it's what the story's been building to. But just to finally see that, and, and it, it, it takes it from the sense of, like, you feel like you know what's happening, you know what's happening, but then you finally see it, and there's no going back from that. Because you, you can kind of know it in the sense that you know what you should do, I think. And then when you see it, then you know what you have to do. It really helps you cross that line. At, at what point in your writing did you know that that particular scene would be in the book? And, and how, did, how did that scene play out in your writing? Yeah. Well, that's when we were out pivotal, writing. yeah? Yeah, we knew we needed a scene. It, uh, it was actually Ted's idea that uh, the format that it ended up in where she's up, that's what you're talking about, where she's up on the mountain yes, or on the yes. hill. Yeah, so she was like, she needs to be standing up, looking down across Haven Valley, seeing it the way that it is, and then in an instant, it's like the blinders get pulled off, 
and to see that how it actually is. Like, we need to demonstrate that. So it's not just, so it's because, there's, like you said, there's a difference about knowing and knowing. <laughs> so it's like I know something in my heart, but then when I see it and I connect with it, and then, you know, going back to what was said earlier, like, you know, when you, when you see the truth, you will be deeply disturbed. Like, we needed to show that part because mm-hmm. that's an a crucial part of the journey. Go ahead, Ted. You were going to say something. Well, I, I, yeah, I, it, that's kind of like, in a way, it's kind of like a, it's one of the big reveals. Like, it, it's like we kind of wrote, in some sense, plot of the novel all around. That was, there's a handful of pivotal scenes that you write mm-hmm. a story around. And that was certainly one of them. So I'm, I'm delighted that you brought it up. Um, the, the big reveal there is that if, if you think about it, fear feeds only on fear. So we have these monsters, the fury, and they feed, they simply exist to replicate themselves. And they have no great, they don't have any agenda beyond that. They just, they, fear lives to, to replicate itself, to feed itself on more fear. So as it turns out, looking down at that very strict religious community, Grace was able to see that there's more fear there, fear of disobedience, fear of consequence, fear of punishment, fear, 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 than anywhere else. So in, in other words, in what, 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 you know, she previously might have thought we were protecting themselves from fear, from the fury, unwittingly what they're doing is actually creating a huge feeding ground for the fury. Mm-hmm. So is true about a lot of religion it actually this is it actually is doing the opposite often of, of what its so-called intent is which is salvation from fear which is uh, stepping into the light and out of darkness we're actually creating our own darkness by actually codifying um, all these restrictions and all the should nots and all the consequences that if you do and all this entire system of punishment which is called law mm-hmm. and, and and so it's like oh my goodness to what extent do have we um as as an institution created a, a you know a system of fear and control in which you know <laughs> I mean, it's ironic when you when you think about it, but we've created a system that actually heightens fear. And so ultimately, you see, well, religion itself, you know, um, misguided, misguided religion in itself is based on fear. So you could say, in many respects, Christianity is, in many respects, a religion that is based in fear. You know, and that is a stark realization. I'm not talking about the teachings of Jesus, or I'm not talking about what Paul wrote. I'm, I'm talking about what Christianity has become. Mm-hmm. And what Christianity becomes. And, and of course, that starts with the Catholicism, you know, which is the first thousand years, um, you know, 1500 years, or more, 1800 years of Christianity, deeply encoded in the entire religion with fear. And that still lives today. In fact, in many respects, it's as great today as it's ever been. And people are beginning to see it, and it's all going to be. And that fear, those fear structures are going to crumble as they are exposed to the light. But that was a massive reveal. Mm-hmm. And it was risky right at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, it, for me, it was, it, was, it was everything that I was like, like you're hoping to see it for you know I, i'm seeing where it's going i'm seeing where it's going it wasn't a surprise to me it might be to some readers it might be a complete oh wow i wasn't expecting this at all um i think i've read enough of your books and by enough i mean all of them that i knew where we were going uh, but just it it was it was important to me that even though i knew where the story was going it didn't really temper the revelation at all that it was still you know profound in in getting to see how grace experiences that um the other thing that yeah. i want to talk about was that, um, was that the other thing i want to talk about was that um grace there is there is a character um that that grace encounters who ultimately um and and i guess we've already said spoilers but ultimately is a fury uh, but it's not. She's not presented as such. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't recall the character's name. Bobby. Uh, okay. Yes. There you go. Uh, Bobby. Bobby. 
Um, in through through the book, I will say that I I was I kept going back and forth. Is is she going to be a fury? Is she going to be something different? Is she going to be something different but still you know malicious? Is she going to be something different and have some sort of redemption to her character arc? Um, at what point did that character enter into your story? Like, at what point did you know, okay, we have to personalize this, as well as have the we we need to have the fury in mass to see the scope of it, but also we have to personalize this for Grace herself. And Rochelle, from maybe the very you can beginning. answer that. Yeah, from the very beginning. Yeah, she was. So the original, yeah. I mean, like on my original story mm-hmm. notes, uh, which I still have because I'm old school and I write story notes <laughs> in a notebook. Every time when I start a novel. Uh, my original story notes had Grace, who's, who was, who's actually had a different name. I think it was Nina or something, because she was younger, and mm-hmm. Bobby. Bobby was actually the only – she changed significantly her, like, mm-hmm. character type. Um, right. As the story evolved, they all do. But she was uh, – that theory represented – um, that was the entire thing, because as the question of what if our fears were like monsters, what if they haunted us, what if we could see them, what if our fears, like, you know, had physical uh, manifestations, which is what the theory uh, represents, like, what if we made relationship with fear? What if fear became our best friend? So the whole original concept was like, I'm going to write a story about a about a girl who lives in the mountains, you know, in uh, a remote community who makes best friends with a monster. And that Mm. monster becomes an incredible threat to her, but also protects her. And it's just very, like, the whole idea was I want to, we want to personify, or I wanted to personify our relationship with fear. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the main things when I went to Ted and we were talking about it, and he was like, oh, that sounds like something I would write. I mean, he said that specifically. Right. That that that's the hook. The hook is like, what if our what if we make our fears like relational? What if we because right. we do yeah. we make yeah. agreements with them. So yeah, from the beginning, yeah. Bobby was crucial to the story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it, it's played really well because I, I kept going with okay. You know, maybe this, maybe this, maybe they're going to surprise me. You know, I don't know, and the story pretty much went like like I saw where it was going. But you you do get in Grace's mindset as you're not sure. Like you you begin to think as she's thinking, is this you know is this being? Does it really have my best interest at heart? And mm-hmm. and as she takes the journey from understanding this you know this idea about about boundaries and letting go, she makes that journey from. She's here to keep me safe. To no, she's here to hold me back. Um, and I think that such a such a it really it really personalizes the story. You kind of have that grand scene of the reveal uh, when she's on the mountain in in its big form. But when she actually confronts Bobby later in the book, then you kind of have that personal revelation. And you have to have both. You have to both understand the concept on a grand human scale, but then also apply it to your own personal life. As well, if you only do one or the other, you'll never truly understand what it is that you're facing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's like, you know, Bobby is probably the most fascinating character in the in the entire book to me because, like Rochelle said, this is where it, Bobby represents the wisdom of the world that puts us to bed at night, keeps us. It, it's what we think will keep us safe. She gives lots of really, really good advice from a human perspective. Mm-hmm. Same kind of advice that our parents gave us, that we give our kids. That the whole world stands up and says, this is how things should be. But we don't, we, we, we don't realize that actually that is, and the energy of that advice actually is fear. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it, with the most, so we find ourselves vacillating back and forth as, as we, encounter Bobby because she sounds so much like what we tell ourselves mm-hmm. and then ultimately to be able to pull back the blinders and go oh my goodness that's that's fear that's fear 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 and then of course the way the way that Grace herself evolves to, you know, as a character to the point where she overcomes that fear through um, you know not not, a, not in a typical way at all so yeah 
really, really good. I, lo- I love that character. And it really doesn't, it wasn't supposed to be a big surprise. It was supposed to be, let's draw the reader into this and mm-hmm. let them actually experience their own lives. Yeah. So you can't then just blindside people because then everything has, you, you got to connect all the dots as you go. Otherwise, you lose, you lose the reader. And then and you, if you try to be tricky and have some kind of massive surprise, there are a number of, uh, there's a number of really cool surprises in the novel. Mm-hmm. But it has to be, you know, as, a, as writers, we get to actually lace those in very carefully, you know, weed those yeah, in very exactly. carefully. Yeah. yeah, with plausibility. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going, I, I'm buying all of this. I'm buying all of this. So mm-hmm. it's not totally out of left field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I know we're, uh, I know Rochelle, I know that you have, have places to be, um, so we'll uh, wrap this up, or at least I'll wrap it up with you. Um, the last question I have, and I always hate asking authors this because they've just released, their, they've just published a book that's just released, but I always like to end by asking, you know, what do you have next? Um, I think you mentioned that, that you're just about to finish up your next novel. Ted, you're getting ready to uh, begin something. So I guess Rochelle first. Um, what can you tell us about what you're working on right now? Um, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not very nice. I mean, I am, um, yeah, I'm getting ready to, uh, I'm continuing to partner with Baker and Ravel, which, you know, mm-hmm. like Ted said before, they're, they've been incredible. They've really given me some freedom to just jump in and write. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm going in a different direction, but I'm really excited and I'm kind of tackling the ideas. Um, I'll just say simply, like, does our past define us mm. um, or can we change our story and, you know, be whoever we want, which is very general. Like, do the trials that we find ourselves born into, I'm born into poverty, therefore I have to be this way. I'm mm. born as a woman, therefore these are the struggles I will face and some of that, yes, but how much of that do we agree with and how much of it do we have control over mm. and, you know, can we find freedom regardless of our circumstances? So I'm kind of taking on, like, that's very general. Um, mm. But that's kind of where I'm going next and I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm getting ready to wrap it up, and which seems crazy because that novel just came out. But, um, yeah, it's, in a, it's, been a, it's been fun to write. I'm excited. Yeah, well, we're we're all excited for it. All right, and and Ted, what what's your project currently? Yeah, I'm taking a dive into a story an idea that I've had for probably a decade. Um, and I think I'm finally at a place in my life where I can write it. Um, but um, it's not. It, it's 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 right now. It's, it's tentatively called Play Dead, but it's a a real. Uh, oof, yeah, it's. I mean, I don't want to talk too much about it uh, mm-hmm. because it's like, you know, I'm just I'm just diving into it. But it it's a it's a complex story that um, about a woman whose view of the world radically shifts through um, a series of really harrowing experiences that she has. Um, but I think in, in this story, it's not going to be nearly as philosophical. More like in some of my previous novels, mm-hmm. unless unless you want it to be, unless you see the whole thing as a metaphor for your own life, which you which you will be able to. But I'm gonna, it's not going to be in, as on point. And instead, I'm going to focus on really, really visceral storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to challenge me. This particular novel is going to challenge me because it's, it's. I think it's more. It's it, in some respects, it's 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 very different than anything I've written before. In other respects, you know, some people say novels are like one trick ponies, right? You write 40 novels and you have this constant drumbeat through all of it. Really, when you boil it down, they say there's only three stories and many would say there's only one story and everything's a remix. That's true. In some ways, that's true. This is an, and it's an, so the, the drumbeats, the things, the struggles that I'm dealing with in my own life, like the ones we've been talking about today, those will be repetitive themes because we cannot tire of those. These are monstrous issues in our lives. This is, this is dealing with the biggest questions we can possibly face, and we're actually dealing with our own enslavement to a system that keeps us in what Jesus called Gehenna, right, mm-hmm. which I just translated hell, but actually in deep suffering. And so all of us are on the same journey of stepping out of that cage of Gehenna into the light, 
there's nothing else that matters. It is for this journey that we came. And so we get to do it through these really fun stories. Um, this one, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that now. That's all I can say about it at this point. Hmm. <laughs> well, we are excited <laughs> for it. And, um, yeah, I, we'll, just, we'll just wait, I guess. I guess we'll wait on it. I don't have another choice. Um, so, <laughs> Rochelle... Ted, thank you guys for taking time out of your day to talk with me. Um, I know our listeners are uh, really looking forward to it. Uh, so thank you so much for being part of this relaunch that Life of Story is doing. Uh, this, this episode is going to be the first episode of our relaunch uh, and should hopefully be up in, in just a couple of days. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you. I just want to say, like, you've always been super supportive and very honest with your reviews and your reading. You're super authentic. Um, as an interviewer, <laughs> as a reader, and so it was a pleasure to be on your show. I was really looking forward to it as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Indeed, and this is, I, I will say, this is the only podcast we're doing. We have lots of opportunities, but, you know, um, so anyway, thank you, Josh, for so many years of journeying with us both, and uh, this, is, this is actually, this is special for me, you know, uh, it really is, and to all the Circle fans out there, all the ancient decades, all the all the people from Josh's generation who followed me through this journey and taken it with me, I you know, just thank you so much. You have no idea what you've meant to me and how you have enabled me to, to take this journey and, and I don't know all of you, but somehow our hearts are connected beyond uh, beyond the form that we know. And so I just I just I'm very, very grateful. So thank you. Choose, you pursue